um, again, thank you so much for your time in talking to me and congratulations on being selected on being my meet and anarchist for September. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your path to anarchy. Um, how did you find this really neato way of life? So I was raised um, in a democratic household, uh, my, especially my mother's side, um, her siblings, um, her parents, all kind of lean Democrat and uh, liberal. And then uh, and for the most part in my life, I didn't really care about politics. I was indifferent to it. Um, didn't affect me. I was interested in chess and piano and philosophy and astronomy and cosmology and theoretical physics and that kind of stuff. So I didn't really care about it. Um, and, um, and then later in life, my, my mother, um, she became more of a hardened socialist. Like she would describe herself as a socialist, Bernie supporter, green environmental eco type person. So, so yeah, we clash right now <laughs> a lot. Um, although we don't talk about it too much because she knows obviously where I stand. So it's like, she's as stubborn as I am. So I'm not going to change her opinion. She's not going to change mine. So why, why bother? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I remember in uh, I think it was 2012 when Obama first was elected, um, she asked me um, who I'm going to vote for because I didn't care about voting at all, and I'm like, all right, all right, I'll vote. And who should I vote for? She's like, vote for Obama. So I did, and that's the first and last time I voted. And I tell people that that's my one sin, well, one of the sins in my life. I have been repenting ever since. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I will never do that again because I would rather not force my opinion via the ballot box onto my neighbor, right? So, um, uh, so yeah, so after that, then um, my wife uh, was pregnant with my first child in, um, our first child in 2010, and that's when I really got into Stefan Molyneux and um, his um, peaceful parenting videos. So I was delving into that. And then through him also, I discovered uh, free markets and um, Austrian economics and libertarianism and that, all that kind of stuff. And that was awesome. Then I, from there, I discovered Larkin Rose and read his um, Most Dangerous Superstition book. And then G. Edward Griffin, The uh, Creature from Jekyll Island, and then a bunch of other books. There's another um, Market for Liberty by the uh, Tannehills. Um, awesome book recommended by Jeff Berwick. I uh, read that. That was made in the 1970s, basically about how a um, stateless society could function, you know, roads and courts and adjudication and security protection and all different, you know, maybe um, defense also. It's a really fascinating book, how all that can function possibly. Really interesting to see the possibilities. Even though it was written in the 1970s, it's very much um, timeless material. So very um, useful information. And it's one of the few books in my life that I've read more than once. It's very rare that I read a book more than once, but that one I'm like, wow, <laughs> I gotta read this one again. And I loved it. Wow. Um, so yeah, all that stuff. And then and then um when I started getting into that, I decided that this is a very important message that needs to be spread. So that's why I started my website, peaceanarchism.com, and my YouTube channel, Peace Anarchism, and my podcast. And uh yeah, I did that first on the Voluntary Virtues Network. And then I branched out to uh, Seeds of Liberty podcast. I was doing that with Jeremy and Dave Painter. And that was awesome. And uh, we kind of stopped doing that and disbanded for various reasons. And now, I mean, I'm still doing my thing. Um, not as, uh, as uh, prolific or I don't post as much, but I still post. And I'm still talking about it. Whoever wants to listen. You know, I don't, I don't consider myself a um, proselytizer where I'm trying to preach to everyone that I know. You know, but if I can sense that a person is receptive, you know, some people are not receptive and are very much right. uh, um, resistant and they push back and they get angry and they argue. Like when I talk to people, I don't want to argue. I hate argument. I hate confrontation. Um, and so if it's going to be like that, all right, don't, you know, don't worry about it, which is why I love having a podcast and a blog because and a YouTube channel, because if you want to hear my views, just go listen to my videos or, what, or, or read my stuff. You know, I don't have to try to convince you or everyone that I meet. <laughs> right. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's my journey. And that's my approach whenever I meet new people. That's great. That's great. That's a good approach. I think, um, I think
acceptance with people instead of just breaking free and saying, you know what, when you're ready, come find me. So um, this is great. So um, I, uh, this is excellent. So was it parenting then that brought you to anarchy? I, I think so. I think that was a major thing. And uh, one of the earliest books that we bought for my kids, I remember my son was uh, one, like in 2011. Uh, and we got this book called the um, A is for Anarchy. <laughs> it's so, it such a good book. And, uh, and it's like, it went through all the letters. And it's so funny. And at the end of the book, it's like, it's like uh, since you can do whatever you want, feel free to rip up this book if you want. And it's kind of funny because that's what eventually happened to the book. It got ripped up. <laughs> Nice. Well and, done. Uh, and my daughter who was born in 2012 she she loved it too and, and she would say um she couldn't say anarchy so she says ankiki she's like let's read the ankiki book, Ankiki book. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun uh they uh yeah and and what else did we get i think yeah there was there's not much like um liberty-minded books for kids and then i'm, I'm so happy when the Tuttle twins books came out um i, I have all those books and I, um, what else? Um, yeah, I mean, the Tuttle Twins have the card game. They have the, the, the teen Choose Your Consequence books. I haven't gotten those, but I would love to get them later. Um, I, I know I'd have the, I do the free market rules thing with them through the Tuttle Twins. And yeah, I love the Tuttle Twins. Like, those guys are awesome. Now they're doing like a cartoon. They, they, they're doing a podcast now, and I'm listening to that with my kids. And so, yeah, it's really taken off. Actually, I, I interviewed Connor Boyack for my podcast because I loved it so much. I interviewed him, I think, three times um, for a couple of the books that came out, and it was great to talk to him. So, yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. So, in September is the rehumanizing issue. And um, what would you say to parents that poo poo? parenting when really we all are starting to to realize that peaceful parenting is the only way to rehumanize a people so how do you defend peaceful parenting i guess is my question so yeah peaceful parenting it's it's so relevant i mean and and even if a person doesn't have kids it's important for them to learn because mm -hmm. everybody we don't have experience being a child you know, so everyone has their own unique experience, so they can it can add something. But um, the way I look at peaceful parenting, I think Jeremy described this one time, which I really loved. It's soft eugenics, <laughs> in the sense that we are shaping uh, the future and the human race, but towards a more peaceful, compassionate, kind, loving. Uh, that's the kind of human being that we're producing right? By, by in, employing peaceful parenting with our kids. You know, we're producing a, um, uh, uh, a future of adults that uh, can reason, that can think for themselves, think independently, think critically, um, you know, and, uh, and, not, and teaching them to not use um, force and coercion to get your way, right? You should learn to reason things out and think, right? Might does not equal right. Of course not. That's that's the that's the way of the state, right? So if we want to if we want to model these principles, first thing we have to do is model them in our kids, you know, and 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 teach them that, you know, you have a dialogue and you talk and and you know, you shouldn't just listen to me because I'm your father. You should listen to me because I'm wise and I have something important to teach you. And even if you think I'm wrong, you know, we can discuss it, right? So don't just take my word for it just because I say it. So, so having, you know, a discussion with your kids and explain these things in ways that they can understand them is so interest, uh, so important and so vital for their intellectual development. And I love the way um, Stefan Malnu puts it, which is like people say, well, I have to spank him because he's too young. He can't understand words and he can't understand argument. I'm like, all right. He's like, all right. So if you don't model reasoning, how you expect him to, to learn how to reason. <laughs> you know? right. So you got to start somewhere and start as soon as possible talking to your kids um, and, and yeah, modeling this behavior that you want them to have. Right. So, you know, if you don't want them to resort to violence to solve their problems, then maybe you shouldn't do it either. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> right. Right. 
So some of the some of the the anti peaceful parenting that I've seen on posts and people comment and we know that this is relevant because we see this on on Facebook posts of parents shaming other parents but these people that are super anti against uh, peaceful parenting their biggest argument is they don't want to have a rambunctious, loud, rude, disruptive, destructive child, which I feel is, is silly. I feel like I've never seen a peaceful parenting child act that way, but, but in their mind, no discipline equals chaos. Right. But it's but it's not no discipline though. But I have discipline in my house. My my daughter knows what I expect. I don't hit. I don't yell. But but there are consequences, right? So how do we change the thinking from consequences to punishment from authoritative? inadvertently or purposely um, parents that are just trying. Yeah. So I think um, um, a uh, basic definition of terms is so important when you discuss these things, like you mentioned the word discipline. Um, and when a person hears discipline, the first thing they think of is corporal punishment, right? Spanking. Right. Um, but, um, and yet, and the other thing, and, and so it's not that right. So, and the other thing is um, very similar to when anarchists, talk the status and we advocate for anarchism um we're not advocating for no rules <laughs> it's no right. rulers right people constantly have that confusion and the same thing with peaceful parenting i think it's not that there's no rules in the household right it's it's that we don't function or we we don't um come from a position of authority where we cannot be questioned you know it's it's like yeah so, so that's that's one thing that's very important to um, to illustrate that uh, yes, there are rules. We do have rules. We we don't want, we don't want our kids going to bed at any time, <laughs> you know. So yes, we do have some rules. Um, but um, it's you know we we can discuss them. We can we can uh, have a dialogue about them, and we can explain why they're necessary, why they're important. You know, like. Um, you know, my wife works from home, so she has to get up at a certain time. We can't just have our kids really getting up at any time. So, you know, so we need rules, definitely. <laughs> you know, we got to get things done. And they don't necessarily understand the urgency of, um, you know, keeping your appointments, getting somewhere at a particular time, right? Maybe kids don't have as good of a time management as adults do. So, so you know, so we have to um, constantly remind them of that, <laughs> you know, that we have to do this and this and this so that we can leave the house on time and get to this place where we need to be, right? Um, so, and the other thing is, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, so, so other parents say that, that kids are unruly or rambunctious um, if they're, I, I guess they, what they think of as peaceful parenting, they think of as permissive parenting, like letting, you, letting your child yeah. do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's exactly what's happened. When I leave my house, uh, of, of a child asking, well, why can't I have whatever it is, you know, mm. and the parent will, um, you know, try and have dialogue with them. And then maybe I'll notice another parent like mean mugging them. Like, don't explain anything to your child. That's your child. You tell them how it is. And, right, right, and when right. I see that right. and I think she was so close, she was so close to having a peaceful parenting moment with her child and society yeah. scared her into... Right into submission almost and right. into that behavior. And I hate that. And I think that's exactly what's happening. I think people have just like anarchy has gotten a bad name. I think peaceful parenting has gotten roped in with, I don't care about my kid. I let them do whatever they want. Cause right. they have this like right. crazy notion of, of what peaceful parenting is. So that's really hard. So, so do you find yourself trying to, open parents and do you stress the importance of confidence in their parenting and, and confidence and research in their parenting? 
So I, I feel like with me, I don't even have to because they can see how I interact with my kids um, and, and, and they can see how my kids act also. Like, I, th I think another fascinating um, effect of peaceful parenting and talking on the same level as your kids and reasoning with them is that they don't develop a fear of adults. I think kids who live in a very strict authoritarian household, they develop a fear of interacting with adults like, like they can't, like they're not on their same level, right? And so my kids, especially my daughter, she's eight right now, but back even when she was like four, I remember she doesn't care who she's talking to. She talks to adults in, in public, we're walking and she's like, hi, how you doing? Like she doesn't care. And, yeah. and I, think, um, I think that was one effect of, of the way we parent is that, uh, yeah, she's not afraid of adults and she, she's like, oh, I wanna talk to this person, so I'm gonna talk to them. <laughs> And she's like, I want to, I want to know something, so I'll ask them a question. So like, she just asks anyone anything. She's got no fear, and I think that's that's pretty amazing. And and the other thing, the other um, comment that I get often about my kids is that um, they say, "Wow, your kids are so calm. They're so, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're not crazy like other kids." And and so this is a fascinating phenomenon as well. So there's an idea of um, deprogramming. So when a child is in, um, let's say, goes to government school or in a, in a strict authoritarian household, let's say, and, and they experience this rigid structure and they're used to that, they're used to not having freedom, you know, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of whatever. And then let's say the parent decides to homeschool and they take their child out of that rigid structure. Then... Um, well, first of all, all the parents around them are going to be like, don't do that because they're going to they're gonna play video games all day. They're, they're going to be unproductive all the time. So, um, well, first of all, it's like, it's like I think back to my um, government schooling. Like when you're forced to be in a particular situation against your will and you can't do what you want, you can't think what you can't study what you want. And you can't, you know, just have free time to do what you want because everything is clogged up with things that you have to do for school. Then when you don't have to do something, let's say on the weekends or let's say summer vacation, you're going to be as far away from books and like anything related to learning as possible. So from the perspective of the parent, they're going to be like, you see, when he's not at school, all he's doing is video games and TV and whatever. He doesn't want to have anything to do with learning and books. So that's why he needs to be at school because otherwise he's never going to read. <laughs> you know, whereas, oh, interesting. That's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, whereas, um, the, so, so yeah, so, so a person who, uh, the, the child who's deprogrammed, who, who, who gets taken out of government school, they have to go through this period. They call it, they call it, they call it deprogramming where, you know, some, sometimes I've heard people, parents say it takes a couple of months where they have to get used to the idea of having their own freedom to, you know, do what they want, study what they want, write what they want. And, and that's, that's an unusual thing for a kid that's been in, in government school for a significant amount of time. Um, and so, and then after that, after that, um, that time is over, then they're like, all right, now what can I do with my time? What do I want to learn? What do I, you know? So, so, but my kids, of course, um, never went through that because they never went to any government school or kindergarten or anything or daycare. So they never had that experience of being forced to learn something against their will for, you know, seven, eight hours a day. Um, and then on top of that, having homework at home that further, that further removes your uh, free time and time that you can spend with your family. Um, so they don't have that experience. So, so they, yeah, they have pretty much the freedom to do what they want. You know, we, we ask them to do some basic things, but basically they have the freedom to, to learn what they want, you know, and we encourage that. And, and so, yeah, what, so like in that case, why would a child be unruly or rambunctious or, or be out of line? if they already have the freedom, if they already have that freedom, like it makes sense for a child who is constantly in a strict um, authoritarian structure that when they have any kind of free time, they're like all over the place. They're like running around in mischief and I don't know, doing whatever things that their parents don't like because they're like, I'm free. <laughs> you yeah. know, so that makes sense. You know, it's like a rubber band that's pulled back and you let go and it goes all the way back the other way, right? So they're just, they're just responding to their freedom. But kids who never experienced that, why would they even be wild and crazy like that? So, so yeah, I, I get that, um, I get that um, comment a lot. They say, your kids are very mature, well-behaved. Like, like, I teach chess classes, and 
my employer allows my kids to come and help me. He, and normally when I, asked, when I first asked him, he's like, he was kind of iffy. But then when um, he got feedback from the, the teachers and the principals of the schools that I would go to, they were like, wow, your, your kids are so well behaved. They help the class. They're so good. <laughs> and awesome. so I got a lot of positive feedback on my kids, you know, also because I pay them. So that, that, I'm sure that helps them. <laughs> but um, and I have no problem with paying them. I, I enjoy. I'm, I'm happy That's that right. they earn their, their money rather than allowance. I hate that idea, by the way. Allowance. I, I never liked it. like money for free for doing nothing. I mean, I much rather them develop, you know, work ethic and the, the, the idea that money comes from uh, producing value. That's so important. Yeah. That's a very important lesson. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I don't really, I don't even have to get into these conversations unless parents ask me, like they mentioned to my kids, like, wow, your kids, you know, <laughs> they act differently. They're calm. <laughs> Same yeah. with mine. You know, mine's, mine's also very calm. Um, she, um, she loves to learn. She loves to, um, she is incredibly intelligent and, and just kind of hangs out and doesn't really have a fear of adults either. And doesn't run around, not probably not a typical kid that, and when I say typical kid, I mean like not screaming, not hanging from the chandeliers. <laughs> right. Uh, she's, she's, um, she's got great manners. Um, she excuses me and may I, and it's fantastic. And so we, we really don't ever have to explain ourselves either. Um, but, but every once in a while we get people that just, so that just exactly what you said, they get their terminology confused and they mm. think we're doing something we're, we're just not, you know, mm. we're not being permissive. Mm. Uh, we're not ignoring anything like she's, she's ahead of the curve for a reason, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that's excellent. So what do you think is just kind of, thinking about the direction of the interview and the theme here and got great information here. So I, I guess I'm curious as to when grownups go through their deprogramming, when they go from being a liberal to an anarchist, there has to be some culture shock. There has to be everything I learned is a lie type stuff going on. Do kids go through that too, do you think, when they're going through that deprogramming from a, a really um, indoctrinated education to a homeschool? Is there kind of that residual statism that kind of hangs on for children like it does? Um, I mean, I think, I think some kids, you know, you know, all kids that go to cover in school, they don't all um, accept the programming, right? Some kids do and, and they get good grades and everything and they get, you know, on a roll and principal's roll. Other kids, um, I'll say, for example, me, um, I didn't care much for school because I knew it was, <laughs> it was garbage. So I, what, what my approach was, was, all right, I got to be here. So I'm not going to strive to be the best and get the highest grades. What I'm going to strive to do is to be mediocre, <laughs> so I don't fail, um, and my own piss off my parents. And I'll just use the free time because you know I'm not going to strive, so it's going to be easy. I yeah, I was definitely I was definitely uh, striving towards mediocrity, <laughs> which is a funny goal. But in the in the realm of government schooling, my goal was to just get by, so that I could have the maximum amount of free time to pursue the things that I really was interested in um, during that time, which was chess, piano, the philosophy, cosmology, astronomy. I did a lot of reading. I'm a, I, I learned a lot. And I tell people, you know, so it's funny, like with my mother, she would say when I was really first getting into this and denouncing the state and government schooling, you know, she would say, it's called the, um, what's it called? Um, I believe it's called the appeal to antiquity, which is, um, Look at you. You have a beautiful wife. You have beautiful kids. You have, um, you have a, good, uh, a good profession, a good job. And you went, to, you went to government school. So what's the problem? Why are you so <laughs> hating on government school? <laughs> and, and I tell people uh, the analogy that I give is um, 
if a child was abused and then they grew up to be a success and the person, and then people came back and said, look at you, you're a successful person. You have a family, you have kids. So what's, what, what are you complaining about? <laughs> and it's like, okay, but I achieved all of this success in spite of all that difficulty in the past. And maybe I would have achieved even more if I didn't know, have to overcome that hurdle that made things difficult, right? So that's how I respond to my, my, my mother when, I, when she says stuff like that. It's like, yes, I did learn a lot of valuable things that I taught myself because I was interested in it. And, and that's really the things that I, I remember and appreciate the most are the things that I learned on my own because I was interested in them, right? And that's really what's, what's the most value, you know, is what, what a person, um, you know, their hobbies, their passions, their interests, because, you know, you don't, you, you know, you, these central planners, they try to, try to um, figure out what a kid needs for the rest of their lives, where, whereas you really don't know. And if, for the most part, if you allow your children to um, pursue to whatever degree, their interests and passions, you never know what it might lead to. It might lead to a business in the future. You never know. Like, for example, right now, I'm a trained acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist. Um, I went to college five and a half years for that. I got a master's degree. But right now, I'm making more money teaching chess lessons, something that I didn't go to college for and something that I taught myself. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, as a teenager, <laughs> which is fascinating to me. <laughs> so That's it great. just illustrates that, you know, it's unpredictable. You never know where your passions may lead you in life. Um, you know, it's like I, I saw a, a great video of uh, it was an excerpt of Alan Watts, who's a famous um, um, philosopher, mostly of Eastern philosophy. And, you know, and, and, he, and he gets questions of his students a lot of, you know, about like, how do I make money? How, you know, what should I study? And he's like, don't worry about the money. Focus on what you love. Focus on what you're interested in. The money will come later. Because if you really get good at something, you become a master, maybe you can charge for it. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. don't worry about the money and just do what you love. Because that's how you create value. That's how you improve the world is by doing what you love. <laughs> So I don't, did, did I answer your question? I don't even know. You did. You did. I, I love it. So, so, so you did, but, but I want to know more, I guess. Sure. So, um, I, I love, I love the two kinds of kids, right? Like the people that don't really like, uh, the education. And so they're like you, they just do whatever they have to do. So they have free time to learn what they actually want to learn. And then the people that just don't accept the indoctrination at all, and they just kind of go through the motions, but they're not really, they're not really uh, subscribing to any of that. So, so these two kids then, so they don't have the residual statism then, right? Are, are there kids that do? Are there kids that lap this up because maybe their parents do, and maybe they just... They believe that good Americans fight for their country no matter what the war. Like there are some kids that believe this. Actually, you know, you know what I think the the emergence of the internet. Um, like when I was in 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 government school, there was no internet, right? And right. I assume with you too. So yeah. right now, kids that are going to to government school, they they have side by side the internet, right? And so I think it's a lot more difficult for state propaganda in government schools to be automatically accepted by the kids because they can just fact check it on the internet. It's just so easy to figure out what's truthful and what's lies. You know, if, if you can do a little research and you're a little savvy with researching things, they can figure it out. So I think the internet has actually, um, it's actually uprooted the, um, how do you say, um, the dominance of government schools over the minds of kids. So it's actually decentralized in a way, um, government schools and, and, and taken away some of their power because now like, like it's just, it just, it, it, to me, the internet displays the irrelevance and the, and the antiquatedness of the government school system. Like kids can learn anything they want. Why do they have to go to a place with desks and chairs and listen to a person write on a chalkboard or even marker on a, on a whiteboard? 
why is that necessary when there's YouTube videos? There so many ways to learn for free Khan Academy online. Like it just, it just shows how the government school is an outdated dinosaur of an institution. So, so I think that, um, so kids are basically, I think they're um, not as susceptible to the government programming as they once were, perhaps, you know, when before you had to get information from libraries or your parents or your grandparents, right? <laughs> now it's like, so, so yes, the, the stranglehold of the state propaganda is loosening, right? It's getting weaker and weaker. The more that information is disseminated throughout the world, the more people can communicate with each other, the more we can uh, connect with other people from other countries all over the world, right? So all this, I think, is a wonderful um, way that, um, that the state is revealing itself to be an antiquated institution. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't really think that... Um, that statism, I, I mean, I see, I see a statism as dying very, <laughs> like, like the internet was one of the greatest inventions that, uh, that could have dealt, uh, you know, that, that dealt a, a very strong blow to statism. So, so yeah, I see a bright future ahead. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Is that, is, is that good? Is that answering? That's good. That's okay. good. So, um, another, another anarchist has, has, um, Let's see. Let me organize my thoughts. Um, I interviewed Sterling Luhan. Oh, I love that guy. I, I interviewed him too. <laughs> he's an awesome guy. <laughs> yeah, he's great. And um, he, I had never actually um, considered this, but he said the way that we raise our children um, with that authoritar uh, authoritar authoritative um, style right. um, gives way for government. So um, the way we teach our child that we are um, the iron fist and as our child grows, they have that like missing person in their life that like tells them what to do and govern. If, if you believe that children are not as likely to be indoctrinated and that the state is kind of losing their, their grip on children, do you think that then will translate to either a different government as our children grow because they're in that authoritative role to fill? Or do you think it will just change, but maybe stay the same? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally see a very bright future. Um, like, you just look at the number of people that don't vote every time there's an election. <laughs> It's a lot, <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's very inspiring to me, <laughs> you know, the number of anarchists um, and libertarians now as compared to 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago is amazing. It's, it's multiplying very rapidly, you know, um, like, you know, Larkin Rose doing a lot of wonderful things, you know, um, Stefan Molyneux doing a lot of wonderful things. Um, Jeff Berg doing a lot of wonderful things. Yeah. You know, all these people, these thought leaders, uh, Stern and Lujan also. Um, and I, I see, yeah, I, I see, I see a wonderful future. I'm, I'm not really, you know, I'm of course the, there's, um, there's always going to be people that are going to try to stick to the status quo and, and try to, uh, you know, take control and, and, um, but, it seems to me that the idea of, of the necessity of the state is deteriorating and more and more people are getting exposed to these ideas again, because of, primarily because of the internet, primarily like, like the ideas are out there. People will, will get exposed to this stuff constantly. And, and I, I think, I think these ideas are so wonderful. Um, it's like, it's like Larkin Rose says, you know, most people, they were not reasoned into statism. Most people grew up in a status household or went to government schooling. And that's how, that's why they believe what they believe. Not because they thought about it. They thought about the possibilities and they came to the conclusion <laughs> that the state is necessary. No, they grew up thinking that way um, by, you know, their family, their parents, their culture and the government schooling. So, so um, yeah, the fact that, that um, the freedom minded philosophy is, is flourishing um, just like, you know, freedom in, in money is flourishing. Like, like why, you know, people were asking me recently, why would somebody choose Bitcoin? I'm like, well, the amazing thing is you don't have to use it if you don't want to, but the very fact that people are choosing to use it tells you that it's awesome, you know? 
and the same thing with with volunteerism and anarchism is like is like um you know people are not forced to believe this stuff but people find value in the philosophy and they find it to be logical and consistent and so that's why it's flourishing <laughs> you know so it doesn't it doesn't need to be drilled into people <laughs> to be anarchists um so yeah i i you know some people see a darker future than i do but i constantly see um a brighter future and i think i think it's important to to stress that because it's so easy to descend into despair so you you mentioned um so you you mentioned uh like when people get become deprogrammed like adults let's say and they get angry right <clears throat> and that's so true like when a um when when a person who never considered anarchism volunteerism before or libertarianism and they begin to look at all these things and and what the state is and you know when you set aside the political euphemisms yes you you get angry so there's the first phase is the angry phase and hopefully you can progress past that phase quickly because you're not really going to going to reach people and connect with people if you're angry all the time you know people don't respond to anger <laughs> and emotion that well you know they respond to calm and calmness and and being courteous and polite and being reasonable you know like i i don't call people to their faces um you know sheeple <laughs> i don't say you brainwashed you're indoctrinated you know why would i do that because that would just that would just um shut them off completely from me and produce you know it would erect a wall and I would never get through that. It would just be pointless and ridiculous. So, so first thing is don't insult <laughs> the person that you're talking to, the person that you want to connect with. You know, you can demonstrate that, you know, interest, you're interested in their perspective and you want to hear what they have to say and why they believe that. And I constantly ask questions to people and, you know, and that's kind of how I do it, you know, and I give my perspective and how things might work differently, you know, without, without an overarching state and without coercion and um yeah without <laughs> without all the ad hominem attacks so so yeah i think there's a much better way to approach that that's excellent what uh what would you say to people that are kind of stuck in their angry phase what what because you know there's a lot of militant anarchists out there there's a lot of anarchists that are angry and they're they're mad <sighs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's true that um when you do realize that you've been lied to for most of your childhood, most of your um uh, formative years, um yeah, it's it's very natural to get go into that and um but you have to come out of it quickly because you can't live like that. That's not a that's not good quality of life. Um and you know, you're, especially if you have kids, you know, you don't want them to grow up angry. <laughs> you don't want them to have that experience of you as being their primary experience. You know, you want them to, you want, you want it to um, demonstrate to them that no, the, the future is beautiful. And you know, what's funny is that, or, or ironic is that what most kids are experiencing now, um, you know, most status, but especially the, um, the eco um, environmental, you know, climate change type people is that their future is doomed. It's like, they have no future. They're like, the world's going to end in like 20 years, you know, sea levels are going to rise. We're all going to be underwater. Why do we even have to do anything? <laughs> you know? So it's so unfortunate to have that view um, <clears throat> of humans that, um, that all we do is destroy and plunder and, and consume the earth. You know, we don't, we don't give anything to you. That's all we do. We just destroy, you know, and, and that's so tragic. And, and um, I mean, I mean, due to the lockdown, I mean, there's a high incidence of suicide. But I think before the lockdown, the suicide was was high just because people, kids were like, why am I even going to why am I even going to try to do anything? You know what I mean? And that's such a tragic way to live. You don't want to you don't want to instill that. And, and so, you know, I was delighted when I discovered um, Alex Epstein and the Center for Industrial Progress. And he talked about that climate. He does a lot about energy and climate change, fossil fuels. And, um, and so he discusses people, you know, from the free market perspective, how not only should we not vilify fossil fuels, but we should celebrate it. That we live so comfortably right now, so safe. We live, we have a long, we have a very um, increased longevity, low infant mortality. People are at all time lows like very few people are dying from climate related 
um, reasons like, you know, hurricanes, floods, tor tornadoes, you know, earthquakes, landslides, all that stuff, um, or, or excess heat or excess cold. So our lives are amazingly comfortable and luxurious. And not only that, but we have, we have the most population ever, almost 8 billion people. And on top of that, we have food surplus. <laughs> so we live in the most abundant time in history. And yet people are depressed that the world is going to end and we're horrible and they're, and they're killing themselves. And it's just, yeah, <laughs> it just saddens me, you know, to, to see that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, suicide was exactly really high before COVID and it's just gotten a little out of control. You take away those few interactions that people actually had and right, right. Those poor people have, have very little to kind of keep going, which is heartbreaking. Um, I think it's a good message to spread, to, to remind people, hey, this is a really, a really good time. And really, the only thing that's making it shitty is government. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's good to kind of remind folks. Um, so let's see. This is so good. <laughs> And I can go on. I just gotta, I gotta, I gotta stop myself at one point. I'm like, Dharma needs to uh, breathe. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta breathe. Like typing, <laughs> <laughs> typing so fast. Yeah. Um, uh, this is fantastic. So let's see. So what do you think? Um, was there any particular thing when you found Malanu, when your beautiful wife was pregnant and you're kind of looking for a good parenting style and you know you want to kind of be different than your parents were, you weren't totally sure maybe how much different, but different. And when you found that book, did you read it and just like... I mean, did it did it completely blow your mind open about how maybe in the system you might have been previous wait which book are you referring to Molyneux. Oh I, oh I never read any of his books actually really um, yeah he had a bunch of books I, I i intended on reading them i never got around to it i was more um influenced by his videos um okay but, uh, yeah i mean I, I mean i assume his books were awesome too i just never got around to reading them well, but tell me about his videos. Tell me, tell me when you were watching his videos, were, was it just one aha moment after another? I mean, I remember, I remember uh, he made a video, something like uh, 17 reasons why you shouldn't spank your children. And, um, and I heard that one and uh, it's pretty amazing. Oh, here's another fascinating thing is that, um, and this goes for anybody who doesn't have kids. It's like you may have an idea of how you're going to parent when you have kids but you really don't know <laughs> until you do have kids. Right. And that was exactly absolutely true with my, with, with me and my wife, because before we had kids, I remember us looking at a school bus and say, can you imagine one day our kids are going to be on that? <laughs> yeah. And, and also we were talking about, we had a brief conversation about spanking. And I remember talking to him like, you know, if our kids are, are not they're doing, you know, something that we don't like, you know, we're just going to hit them. Right. And she's like, yeah, I guess so. Like, like we didn't really give it a second thought, right? We didn't think that it was a deep issue to explore, you know, primarily because, you know, we were both um, spanked and had corporal punishment with our, with our parents, um, as most parents did. Um, so we just didn't give it a second thought. And then when I stumbled upon Stefan Molyneux's videos, it just, it clicked and it made sense, you know? And I'm like, why am I going to do that? You know, that's, that makes so much sense. Um, you know, just even leaving aside the fact that that produces like trauma in the brain and it lowers their IQ, you know, just even aside from that, just, just the fact that like, I, I want to, I want to encourage reason and logical deduction, my kids, I want to talk to them. And, um, as you know, as, as much as I can as adults and just, you know, encourage their verbal development. I want to do that. Why would I want to shut off communication with my own kids so that I can hit them. Why, why would I want to do that? That's counterproductive. You know, it's like you want to hit them, but at the same time you want them to grow up. It's kind of, it's kind of strange. It is, it's <laughs> real strange. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that was, that was fascinating that, that we, 
chose, we were thinking about parenting one way and we decided to parent the exact opposite once we had kids. So did, did you have that experience with your? I did. I did. Well, I did actually, to, to an extent I did. I knew that I wanted to be different than my parents because I, I didn't have a great childhood. So mm. I didn't know what that looked like necessarily, but I knew that I wanted to do it different. Yeah. And um, I had st- Uh, and love and logic is, uh, I think I actually have it close, but so love and logic is a, I hear it. Is. Nice to have my library close by, uh, love and logic. I think. Nice. For childhood, yeah. Nice. So I had I had picked this up. Uh, my daughter, um, I think, was just uh, maybe four or five months old at the time that I found that book. Mm-hmm. Um, so we weren't needing discipline by any means. Um, she was pretty developmentally delayed, so um, we really didn't need a whole lot of parenting stuff. Just kind of keeping her alive and junk. <laughs> so, yeah. but but I knew that those days would come eventually. That we would kind of need some better parenting style when she starts getting mobile and communicative. Yeah. Um, and so when I read that book, I thought, wow, like you can just talk to your kids. Like you can just have a conversation <laughs> with them. Like, right. <laughs> that's amazing. You know? know, it blew my mind, you know? And so um, what really stuck me was how to have a love and logic, peaceful experience with your kids when they're nonverbal that was really difficult to me. And, Mm. and my brain wanted to go to spanking because how else do you talk to a kid that's nonverbal? You you know, like that's, that tells them it's not okay, you know, but I didn't want that. I thought that seems like punishment uh, just for not being able to communicate. And that seems horrible to me. Yeah. So the book really kind of helped, you know, like if she throws the plate of food on the floor, just, uh Oh, you know, I was, yeah. uh oh, that's a problem, you know? And <laughs> so then we would, you know, like, you can't throw that on the floor, you know, whatever, and like have like a conversation, be done with it, don't lecture with it. And it, it was, it was incredible. It was incredible that something so simple that wasn't lecture that, that, because I feel like lecturing amps you up, like lecturing, like builds your angry, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, I, that and so the book and peaceful parenting really kind of helped it's logic it makes a lot of sense let let me tell you a funny story real quick about this topic um so i hang out with a group of families that are very you know in general critical of government school some of them homeschool some of them don't um and yeah group yeah basically they're all like against vaccines so that's why they're critical of schooling in general but in in addition for other reasons too but um Um, and, and all of them basically are peaceful parents. Like they don't spank and, and yet, um, so with me, when when I interact with my kids in public, um, I guess I'm, I'm, uh, more calm. So people (laughs) like my friends, they say, they say, wow, you never raise your voice. You never yell or shout at your kids. And, and it's funny because at home, my wife thinks I shout too much. <laughs> so it's funny. Maybe it's like a case of you act differently behind closed doors. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but I, I mean, I think e- even at home, um, you know, my kids would say that mommy shouts more than daddy. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, I mean, when, when my kids do something wrong, I'm like, you know, all they say, all, all they say, God, Daniel, the only thing you do when your kids do is like, Marcus, Serena, <laughs> that's all I do. <laughs> and I talk to them, but that's the only tone I use. So yeah, yeah it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. <laughs> it's, it's great, isn't it? Because I mean, the, I feel like the, the creative approach to raising kids is uh, cloaked in anger, mm. right? Mm. Like parents are anger because they're frustrated, they're annoyed, tired, uh, they're not self-caring. Um, and so they're, they're like walking the razor's edge, right? Mm. 
them to hit. It teaches them to degrade. It teaches them to, to mock or make fun of or think fuels that anger, right? It yeah. fuels that like, I'm angry. The situation is making me angry or uh, having to continuously lecture you makes me angry or, right. and it's so unproductive. And yeah. I see that in public where parents are just so tired. And I think a little love and logic um, could just take so much stress out of your life. You know, I mean, like my kid has, has, she's not a perfect kid. She has Mm. some issues. I have some issues. We're, we're learning, you know, but it's, but it's not, it's not scary. It's not, um, it's not a lot of the typical experience. It's much better. And I can't imagine raising my kid the way some of these people are raising their kids. Yeah. And, and that's another great point is that we're not perfect. The people who employ peaceful parenting are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but right. we try and we have a goal that we strive towards, right? And that's important to have a goal. Um, and so I met this one woman um, on one of this uh, homeschooling um, programs that we were going to this farm and uh, I, I, I realized, I, I discovered that she has um, a podcast, a YouTube channel and a website called The Parenting Junkie. So she promotes peaceful parenting a lot and we connected and, and I eventually interviewed her <clears throat> for my podcast and then she interviewed me for her like she does like online classes. And one, um, one uh, comment she made was, she's like, um, she's like uh, I just want to tell you all that I've met Daniel in person. I see how he is with his kids. He is so incredibly patient. I can't believe it because I lose my, <laughs> I lose my cool so easily. And I've never seen him get angry or yell at his kids. And it's just amazing. <laughs> so I thought yeah. that was interesting coming from someone who has a peaceful parenting YouTube channel and a blog. <laughs> yeah. So well, see, even, I mean. even her, even her. Yeah. I mean, we try, right? We totally try. And, and, um, I'm definitely one that can say that I, I was a yeller. Like I would, I, there are certain situations that, that I yelled and I hated it. Oh my gosh. I hated it. And uh, about a month ago or so I was, I was venting to Jeremy and I'm like, I just, I just hate that I yell at her. Like I, I hate it. Mm. But I lose my temper and I don't have much patience to begin with. So believe me, parenting has been really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> and so so he he had turned me on onto you and to your videos. And the first video I saw was the peaceful parenting video about how, you know, what what we're raised as is is so much different than than what we can do. Mm. And um I watched it with my kiddo. Uh, I plopped her down next to me and we watched the video and I watched her watch the video with great big eyes and then <laughs> look at me and see if I was like going to get mad. And really? Maybe look, yeah. And she looked the video. Uh, again. Let's talk about this. So we, so we paused the video and we had a really great conversation. Nice. We, uh, we talked about how, mommy sometimes is scary. And (laughs) I said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to be better. Yeah, that's good. A way to be better. And so, um, we talked it out and so, um, it was great. And so I haven't yelled since. (laughs) Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've never been, um, the angry type of person anyway. I'm, I'm more of a calm, mellow type of relaxed person, which is also why, like, I've never smoked weed. So I tell people, why would I even need, do I need to be more relaxed? I don't need to be yeah. more relaxed. I'm happy the way I am. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but the other thing I wanted to say that's important um, for parents to have is humility. Um, humility in the sense that when you do something wrong, you apologize to your child. You say, I'm sorry, you know, and I make sure to do that with my kids it's so important because it illustrates that um, we're not perfect and we have flaws and we make mistakes. But when you do, you own up to them and you try to improve, you know, and that's, uh, if you can admit to that, I think that shows um, a strength of character that's, uh, that's unique. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, um, I, I believe in that. I believe in normalizing apologizing to children is, mm. is important. Um, because, I mean, aside from leading by example, I think it teaches children exactly that, your humility, that we're not perfect. And yeah. we don't claim to be, at least I don't claim to be a perfect parent. I, I have learned more just being a parent than I could have ever learned um, taking classes or reading books. She yeah. has taught me an infinite amount, um, just, just about myself mostly, but it's been really important information to have to kind of be better. Yeah. And I really, I really, I really apologize. I really, I really mm. love apologizing to children. When she and I had that talk about your video, um, mm. you know, I told her, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. Uh, I have no, and I think if we work together more, I think we can have a better, a better go at this. And she was, she was excited and, um, you know, I think it's been a good learning experience for both of us. You know, it's been more of a learning experience, um, for her. Um, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot else. I, um, I think this is fantastic. And you, my friend are just, you're like a light in a dark room. So uh, I'm <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> very appreciative to you. I mean, you've, you've helped me personally quite a bit and um, you've been a great addition to the magazine too. So. Wow. That's wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, wonderful to hear that. Um, yeah. You know, it's amazing having a YouTube channel and a podcast. It's like, you never know who you're going to touch and who you're going to affect in their lives. And uh, n people don't always give you feedback. Um, right. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I always encourage people, give me feedback, give me feedback. You like it, you hate it. doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, it's nice to hear feedback occasionally um, from people Absolutely. who like it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and um, you know, I get a lot of feedback um, for the magazine, um, mm. just people in passing mostly. I wish I got more in print because mm. I would be able to forward those. But I get a lot of people that really enjoy the kids section, especially in the magazine. And I think, I think definitely parents and non-parents alike are getting a lot of, a lot of uh, use out of the kids section in the magazine, mm. which includes you and, and Derica too. And it's been really great to have you guys um, aboard because again, I don't know what I'm doing as a parent. I have no idea. So if, if I can um, cross train with some people that have done it successfully or that are doing it successfully, then heck yeah. Mm -hmm. or yeah. as much as possible yeah. yeah yeah that's uh yeah that's wonderful and for the feedback I, one thing i would recommend is um if somebody if somebody um writes a comment in facebook or maybe sends you a facebook message or an email something in print then i, I would just ask them can i use this as a testimonial and yeah. so and so that's that's what i do with my with my chess classes i have like a whole document of you know because when you ask somebody can you write a testimonial then people are going to be like, eh, I don't really have time, <laughs> but people, but people are all the time giving you positive feedback and they're not necessarily doing it official as a testimonial. Just, you know, just say, can I use that as a testimonial? And they're like, oh, sure. So that's kind of how I have, have uh, accumulated all my feedback. <laughs> I would like that. I, I'm going to have to do something for, for people that, that say it to me in passing because yeah. no, one, no one sent it to me in writing anymore. Oh, damn. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> right or just coming from know, the author you know or just or, or maybe after you meet them then you write it down quickly and then you text it back to them. or is it is it are these people you know or people you don't know both okay so Definitely. if it's people that you know yeah write it down quickly then text it back to them and say is this what you said and can i use this as a testimonial so that's, that's a great what, that's idea what, that's what i would do <laughs> because yeah when people give you feedback of your content it's so valuable you know it's yes. like it's like the best the best advertisement so like when I do my newsletter, my, my, when I post a video on my, on my YouTube channel, I do a, I send out a newsletter. I, I have a section fan feedback and I just include a quote of something that somebody said about that post, you know, and either it could be yeah. Facebook, could be email, could be, you know, whatever comment message. So yeah, yeah. That's, really, that's really convincing when people see that. <laughs> I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to text them and you know, did you say this? Can yep. I use this? Because yep. that would be great. Excellent. <laughs> I am so.
to you. And I am very, very um, just humbled by the experience of talking with you and kind of getting your perspective on anarchy and parenting and kind of path. And I think it's really marvelous. And I'm so happy that we could spend a little bit of time together to, you know, talk and get to know each other and find. I'm so happy to have you on board. Yeah, I'm delighted to be on board and so happy that Jeremy contacted me and let me know about your project. And I'm uh, delighted to contribute and uh, hopefully make it awesome and hopefully it can reach many people. Yeah, that's the hope. Thank you so much. I'm Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and voluntarism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day.